Good afternoon. This is Dyke Hendrickson, and this is the podcast called Life Along the Merrimack. Each week we get together at this time and we talk about the health and history of the Merrimack River. Today I wanted to show some slides um, about the river and also talk about legislation and how the river can get cleaner. Now, this week marks the beginning of spring. Sometimes you can't tell it, I know. I think it was 12 degrees the other night. But we're getting towards spring and we're getting towards the time that people think about boating and fishing, going out on some of the, um, not only their own pleasure boats, but the ones that are docked in Newburyport and other places. And so legislation is important because the river is sometimes getting dirtier, not cleaner. And what I mean by that is several years ago, American Rivers, which is a national nonprofit based in Washington, D.C., released a list of the 10 most vulnerable rivers in the U.S. And the Merrimack was on that list. There were others that you know, the Tennessee River, the Hudson, but the Merrimack River was there. And what the scientists found about the Merrimack were three sources of pollution and therefore concern. <laughs> it was um, discharges from sewage treatment plants. And we have talked about that. The, the piping in most communities um, picks up rainwater as well as sewage. And all of that goes in the sewage treatment plant. Now, usually that works, but when the rain is hard, or when the storms are significant, all that water that the pipes pick up, plus the sewage, overwhelms the sewage treatment plant. And I'm talking about Haverhill, Lawrence, Lowell, Manchester, New Hampshire. And when there's too much uh, liquid in there, effluent and water, there's a discharge. And millions of raw sewage come out every year. Now, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the state um, Department of Environmental Protection. They know about this. These communities are on notice that they have to work to um, improve this and to stop it. But for now, that is still happening. So discharges is one area of concern um, for scientists. Another is the residential and commercial buildup near the river. And that means a lot of the trees are coming down. A lot of the um, marsh in some places, a lot of grass in communities is disappearing. And this acts as a filter for a lot of pollution. And when that disappears, you have more polluted rainwater, polluted stormwater, all of it going into the river. The third element of pollution here, and this is a little harder to put one's finger on, is the fact that some factories and some industrial um, output areas, put a lot of chemicals into the river. Uh, some we know about, some we don't know about, but um, there are chemicals going into the river that essentially you're never gonna break up or it takes hundreds of years. And so that is very important. It's, as I say, you need some scientists on the ball to assess the river water and find out what chemicals. But the reason, it is very significant is because more than 500,000 people on the North Shore still get their drinking water from the Merrimack River. So think, I mean, granted, that river water is being purified and cleansed through scientific methods, which we will talk about in a moment. But still, it's a little concerning that we're getting chemicals into the river that we don't quite understand what they are and we must be careful about uh, monitoring this. Now the state EPA knows about this, but again, it, you know, it's a difficult thing. And with new chemicals coming along, new chemicals coming into the river, it's important to be concerned because again, half a million people are getting their drinking water from the Merrimack. And it's getting near spring, as I say, and this week, several groups um, are trying to interest their membership in lobbying 
for better legislation and also donating. The Merrimack River Watershed Council is one of those. I am the uh, unattached historian for that group. And there's another Mass Massachusetts Rivers Alliance is also having a week where they want their members to think about lobbying, think about talking to city councilors and state reps and say, look, what are we gonna do this spring to try to make the river cleaner, to put some regulations in? And I might mention that um, the last session of the state legislature had a very successful meeting in terms of the Merrimack. The legislature approved and Governor Baker signed a bill that requires sewage treatment plants upriver to notify uh, state of, uh, officials and individuals downriver when they've had these um, combined sewage discharges that we just discussed. Now, this is an important thing. You might think <laughs> that a sewage plant operator would say, well, we just let you know a million gallons go. There's a lot of effluent there. We will have a press release. We will call the mayors. We will call the yacht clubs. Well, that never happens. Um, or let's say it doesn't happen on a, a mandated basis. So this law, which as I say, was only signed a month or two ago, makes it mandatory. And this again is Haverhill, Lawrence, Lowell, Manchester, New Hampshire. Now also on the, the good side of the ledger, talking about Manchester, New Hampshire, is the fact that last fall, they entered into an agreement with the state EPA and the feds, which said they are going to have a 20 year program to clean up the river. It's about $132 million. They're getting low interest federal loans to do this, but this is an enormous step forward um, because Manchester uh, is the largest polluter on the river. They do have a sewage treatment plant, of course, but again, it, get, it overflows. Enormous amount of effluent goes into the river from Manchester. So that is a good development. And again, it's kind of what a lot of people along the river are trying to do. They're trying to work with Lowell and Lawrence and Haverhill and um, force them or cajole them into creating improvement plans for their sewage treatment plants. You know, each community is doing that. But, you know, their want to fall back and say, we just don't have that much money. Well, you know, what community leader would say, gee, we have too much money, we'll put it towards sewage treatment. Very few say that. But I just mentioned it. There's more activism now. There's more of a desire to have clean water. And you can see here in this slide, um, and I'm talking to a radio audience, I know that, this is for the TV audience, um, of Newburyport Harbor. And in recent years, uh, as the water has become cleaner, many more vessels have um, moored themselves in the harbor. They take slips along the river. And last year, there were close to 1,500 vessels on the Newburyport side. There were 500 more in Salisbury, Amesbury, and other communities. And Cashman Park uh, had you know, thousands over a given boating season that were put in at Cashman Park. Now, Cashman is the most active uh, mobile uh, launch park in the state uh, in terms of state parks. So there's many more people going to the river. Uh, fishing is getting better over the years. Um, there's a lot of people who take jet skis out. There are kayakers, there are canoers. There were the voyagers two summers ago who came down the whole 117 miles of the river. And, you know, they drew attention to the fact that yes, the river has gotten cleaner in the past couple of decades, but we still got to keep working. Anyway, here's New Bay Port Harbor. And um, many of you either walk along it or have enjoyed it in some way, but this is, you know, the end of the river and um, one of the great showpieces of the river. And I'm going to, be moving along and talking about some different elements. I'm having trouble advancing this slide, however. 
And a situation, it's a be- still a beautiful river. Here's a town line at Amesbury, Merrimack. And you can see, you know, the beauty of it. And even though we frequently talk about pollution, it's still in most places a gorgeous place. The fishing industry, and this photo shows um, several fishing boats on the Newburyport Harbor. Um, fishing has diminished in recent years. And there are several reasons, of course. Federal regulations have limited the catch. Um, it's harder to make money in this area. Um, it's very expensive to keep a boat going. One of the greatest attributes of a captain is to be a mechanic, really. Um, if you read The Perfect Storm, you know, half of the book was about problems with the boat, problems with the boat, um, taking it off, you know, just improving the engine, trying to get everything working. Fishing used to be an enormous industry in Newburyport. Uh, this, we, I live in Newburyport, and the fishing industry, there were several hundred ve- vessels, say 18, 1790 to 1860. It was enormous. And two to f- five people would be on a vessel. Some would go out for the day. Some would go up to, towards Nova Scotia. And it was a very dangerous profession uh, or trade. Uh, we know it's dangerous, but it sticks in my mind something called the Yankee Gale. In 1852, there was a tremendous sudden storm off the North Shore, and um, hundreds of vessels were out. They didn't know the storm was coming, and 92 vessels were lost, and 24 of those fishing boats were from Newburyport. And so you can imagine the grief and the devastation it would do to a community to lose 24 boats. That means, you know, 48 to 100 men. There were very few women at the time. So fishing has always been, uh, I wouldn't call it a desperate trade, but a very difficult trade, and certainly one that um, has taken lives over the years. Here's a jaunty little photo. and for radio listeners, what we're looking at is a kayak. Um, state Rep Jim Kelkors is in the stern, and State Senator Diana DiZoglio is in the bow. And this was, took part took place a couple summers ago. They were part of the Voyagers group. Uh, again, they wanted to bring attention to the beauty of the river, but also to the challenges of the river. And so they started in Franklin, New Hampshire, and in four days time, they came all the way down the river, 117 miles. So this is one of my favorite photos. I did not go on this kayaking mission, Um, but it certainly drew attention in every community. They had press conferences, they had scientists to explain the challenges to the river, but it was pretty much fun for a lot of people. About 12 took part in all all four days, and I'd say close to 20 were involved uh, in part of it. Mayor Donna Holiday of Newburyport um, was part of that mission as well. I wrote a book recently titled um, Merrimack, the Resilient River, and it'll be out October 25th, April 25th, excuse me. But one of my favorite characters was the one that you're seeing on the screen now, Ellen Swallow Richards. She was a scientist um, and quite a remarkable human being. She was the first woman graduate of MIT. That was in 1883. She kept going to MIT after graduation and earned enough credits for a master's degree in biology and science, except in those days, they didn't give advanced degrees to women. So she, she had enough credits, but unfortunately did not get a degree. But I mentioned her because this is an important uh, story about the river. In the 1880s and 1890s, there were many families, um, mill, fa- mill working families who lived near the Merrimack River in Lowell, Lawrence, Haverhill, um, and Manchester. But unlike today, 
the poor people live near the river. They might get a view of the river from a four story tenement. They were close to the river and they got their drinking water from the river. The wealthier people, meanwhile, lived farther from the river and they got their drinking water from clean wells. Now, water was purified, if I could use the term, but not very well. And in the early 1890s, uh, a number of young people from um, the Lawrence and Lowell areas got typhoid. And this was very serious. They were dying and, you know, there was a significant, everyone knew the river was terribly polluted, but the state created a board of top scientists to go up to Lawrence, Mass, and find out what's going on. Ellen Swallow Richards was one of them. Now there are five or six guys, but since women aren't too, too much highlighted in this particular field, I wanted to bring her out. Um, and she was the one with a few others who improved the science of drinking water and created a method that was much cleaner and much healthier. This was so successful, Lowell started using it, Havel did, and then it spread across the country. She and her team revolutionized the science of drinking water. She also was, is called the mother of home economics. Now to us, home economics is a word we've heard for a long time. But in those days, 1890 or so, a lot of, um, women or people in the household did not appreciate cleanliness in the kitchen. They did not, did not know so much about having balanced meals or having clean water. So in addition to being a BAFO scientist in drinking water, she's known as a mother of home economics. She also started a free lunch program in Cambridge where she lived. And that was also a first. So this is a very remarkable woman. When we talk about clean water, um, in Merrimack or anywhere in this country, in rivers and lakes and the ocean. One of the key figures is Edmund Muskie. That's his photo that we're looking at right now. He was from Maine and uh, was a senator there for, oh, 25 or 30 years and then became a secretary of state. But this is a very important because Maine, you know, the Kennebec, the Androscoggin, and the Penobscot, they were hugely polluted, mostly from paper companies upstream and then mills downstream. Muskie was a courageous guy, however. He grew up in Rumford, which is very polluted in that area. And he just said, I'm gonna work for clean water. And he engineered the passing of the Clean Water Act in 1972. He was a national figure as well, ran um, as vice president uh, in 1968 with Hubert Humphrey, did not win, uh, but he kept working uh, for clean water. And this is um, after, this is towards the end when they're getting close to passing the Clean Water Act. That's his wife, Jane, to the left. And he's a, really a hero for staying with it. He, you know, for just the Clean Water Act, he had more than 33 public hearings, some in Washington, some in the outback, but despite his disappointment in national office, he was very successful and was worked hard. When we think about the environmental movement, we think of Muskie, but what is intriguing is that the environmental movement did not start till 1969. And it started because the Cuyahoga River in Ohio caught fire. This is true. I mean, some folks have seen the photos there. They're kind of legendary in the pollution field. Uh, maybe others don't know, but the river caught fire and, and the politicians just got so much uh, concern from voters that almost all um, Republicans and Democrats felt something had to be done to clean the rivers and the lakes. So in 1970, Richard Nixon um, created the environmental Environmental Protection Agency in 1970. Now I know Nixon turned out to be a rogue, but he does have his name on this. And the attorney general who signed off on the first, first lawsuit against polluters was John Mitchell, who also turned out to be a rogue. But Muskie was great 
And um, that in those days, he passed a law that gave free grants to cities like all cities, uh, Lowell, Haverhill, Newburyport, Amesbury. He was a hero. George Mitchell, also from Maine, was a, a great hero. He's not as well known for his role, but I talked to, for my book, I talked to a veteran from the Environmental Protection Agency, and he said, he worked in New England. He said, well, don't forget George Mitchell in your book. Because what happened was in 1987, uh, President Ronald Reagan wanted to get rid of uh, the grants for um, sewage treatment plants. This was essentially free money. And, but George Mitchell, who was a Senator from Maine said, okay, we'll compromise. You can get rid of the grants, but we must have low interest loans for sewage treatment plants. And this actually came to pass in 1987. And it's so valuable even today. And that's what Lori Trahan, she's a Congress, congressional rep from the Lowell area, Seth Moulton from the North Shore, another congressional representative. That's what they're going for. Low interest loans for to clean up rivers and lakes. And it's right now, low interest is 1.5%. Now that is quite low. And so I know many communities are looking into it now. And especially since we have the Biden administration, the Environmental Protection Agency and other bureaucrats are much more amenable to listening to proposals for, for um, these low interest grants. As I understand it, the Trump administration did not want to do that. But this is a good time. And as we say, spring is coming. But George Mitchell of Maine was really, like Muskie, a very valuable person in our discussion of environmental improvements. Paul Songus of Massachusetts, here's a photo of him we're looking at, was a champion of Lowell, which of course is one of the major cities on the river, and of the Merrimack River. He um, was a senator for quite a number of years. Here's his young family. I love this picture. His wife, Nikki, on the right, who essentially, um, she was a congresswoman herself. And so, you know, these are looking back at the old days to some champions of the Merrimack River. Paul Sangas died in 1997 at the age of 56. And here is his grave site adjacent to the Merrimack. It's a beautiful site, um, but a very unfortunate moment for all of us and people on the North Shore because, you know, he got a lot of good reforms in. He was able to build a civic center in uh, Worcester and as well as uh, in Lowell. And um, a lot of good things happened when Paul Songus was on the North Shore. Here's a wonderful photo of the Merrimack River. Um, this is the Whittier Bridge that connects uh, Newburyport and Amesbury. Um, I still don't know how much this costs. It started out at $292 million. This is several years ago. And as I go through the clips, I, three, I see stories. The $310 million bridge or the $330 million bridge. But suffice it to say that Newburyport and the whole area of the North Shore was fortunate to get um, a bridge, a new bridge. And you can see the beauty of the river and one of the great old residents near the Maudsley estate in the background. Here is uh, one thing we don't like to see, but it does happen. This is a water runoff pipe and Methuen. Um, this is not coming from the sewage treatment plant. This is coming from the street. But you can see, um, you know, those shopping carts are indicative of pollution. You know, every now and then you'll see a story in the local paper that they pull tires out of the river, or sometimes they even pull small cars out of the river and bicycles. So again, there are beautiful parts of the river, but um, other parts of it are quite compromised. Here's Newburyport, a glorious little town, as you know, but this is uh, to the left in the bottom of the photo shows a pipe coming down. It probably starts at High Street and picks up a lot of dirt and residue and that type of thing as it comes closer to the river. But this is it, they're trying to do better and um, 
this is the start of the Peter Matthews boardwalk. And it's true that in Newburyport, Byron Matthews gets all the credit for the downtown. Peter Matthews was his brother, had been uh, the mayor here as well. And this is a Peter Matthews um, boardwalk. Here's a wonderful shot of the river. You can see the glory of it all in the ha Haverhill, Amesbury area. You can also see quite a bit of development going on near the river, um, adjacent to the river. Of course, each new development means more water going into the sewage treatment plant. Sewage treatment plants are gonna have to be extended and expanded, that's another thing. Um, but this is, I love this photo, it's a glorious photo and just shows you the great importance and uh, centrality that the Merrimack River has on the North Shore. The Merrimack River uh, and the Salisbury Bridge is a beautiful spot. Uh, Dan Grovac, who is the head, uh, the chair of the Watershed Council took this photo. He's a great photographer. State Senator D Diana DeZoglio, shown here, has been um, a great leader in keeping the river clean. Uh, she was instrumental in creating the Merrimack River Commission last year, which is another step forward. Uh, she's from Methuen and really has been at the forefront of improvements on the river. I hate to do it to you. Excuse me, I shouldn't have said that. Here's a photo of Richard Nixon, Hubert Humphrey, and Ed Muskie. Um, a lot of people haven't seen pictures of Richard Nixon lately. Here he's smiling. This must have been before the paper started flying on the Watergate scandal. But he was the one who started the EPA, as we said. Curiously, when Ed Muskie's Clean Water Act passed in 1972, Nixon vetoed it. Um, but the concern was great and Congress passed um, the Clean Water Act over Nixon's veto. This is the end of the presentation. Uh, I always enjoy giving it. This shows a beautiful shot. This is from Mosley Woods or Mosley Pines as it used to be known as, um, looking up river. Um, Mosley Pines is a wonderful spot for dog walking, I might say. It also is that you can walk along the river. You can't put a boat there, you can't fish, but you can certainly see the majesty of the river, um, the Whittier Bridge that pulls all of this together. And so as we enter spring, and as we get near the boating season, I would mention again that many public officials will be trying to do more uh, for clean water. There are a lot of people who uh, will be out boating this spring and summer, out fishing, some even go swimming there. And that is where I must say that these warnings from upstream are important. If it hasn't rained for about a week, probably some people do go swimming. But if there's been a big rain, if there's been a sewage overflow with millions of gallons of pollution going into the river, people downriver should know about that so they don't go swimming, so they don't hop off their boat if they're hot that day. So that is one out piece of legislation that did pass recently and is good. There will be warnings when there have been releases upriver. So that's it. This is Dyke Hendrickson. This is Radio 99.6 Joppa Radio and Channel 9 on local cable. We're here every Tuesday at two o'clock. For next week, I'm trying to get the fellow who runs the bird shop on the Newburyport Rotary because I want to talk about some of the birds that will soon be arriving and are arriving. But for now, this is Life Along the Merrimack. We talk about the health and history of the Merrimack River. I am Dyke Hendrickson, and we'll talk again next week. Thank you for being with us.